In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. So we go to Revelation 19, and chapters, chapters 16, 17, and 18, it underlines how, God's, how God gave his people the chance to repent. They did not repent. It underlines this great judgment that would, that would take place upon what's called Babylon the Great, which it's an image of all those who are opposed to Christ and his church. And so in Revelation chapter 19, you have a series of alleluias, okay? And so we're going to go through and read why do we have these alleluias and, and why are they structured a certain way? So we're going, to, we're going to talk about this. Of course, it's all leading us to this great wedding celebration. What's the wedding celebration going to be? After God's judgment has been poured out upon all those who are disobedient, after his kingship has been definitively established, what is this great wedding celebration that's going to be, be celebrated? What is it? The, the celebration of what? What's it called? The marriage supper of? Of the Lamb. I knew you guys would get that, okay? The marriage supper of the Lamb. So let's go to 19. Are you guys ready? And it says, After this, what sounded like, like a loud voice of a great multitude in heaven saying, After this, I heard what sounded like the loud voice of a great multitude in heaven saying, Now remember the great multitude that was in Revelation chapter 7 before the throne? It's recalling that great multitude. And look at what they say. Alleluia. Notice how many times they say Alleluia. Alleluia. Salvation, glory, and might belong to our God, for true and just are his judgments. He has condemned who? The great harlot, who corrupted the earth with her harlotry. He has avenged, he has avenged on her the blood of his servants. They said a second time. How, now we're at the second Alleluia. Are you ready? Alleluia. Smoke will rise from her forever and ever. Oh boy. And the 24 elders and the four living creatures fell down and worshiped God who sat on, sat on the throne saying, and here we go, amen and alleluia. A voice coming from the throne said, praise our God, all you servants who revere him, small and great. Then I heard something like the sound of a great multitude or the sound of rushing water or mighty peals of thunder. As they said, and here we go again, alleluia. The Lord has established his reign. Our God, the Almighty, let us rejoice and be glad and give him glory. For the wedding day of the Lamb has come. His bride has done what? Has made herself what? Ready. She, is, she was allowed to wear a bright, clean linen garment. Now, now notice that the they fourth Alleluia can be sung once the bride is ready. What must the bride do to be ready? What must it have? It must have faith. It must have repentance. It must, it must have faith and repentance, okay? What, is the, what do you think the clean linen represents? What do you think the, the linen garment represents? Re faith and repentance. It could also represent good works, work, uh, holy works. The linen, here's, and here's why. Look what it says. She was allowed to wear a bright, clean linen garment, and then... Right after it says she's allowed to wear a linen garment, what does it say? The linen represents what? The righteous deeds of the holy ones, you see? The angel said to me, write this, blessed are those who have been called to what? The wedding feast of who? Of the Lamb. We say, a similar, we say similar words right before you come to receive the Eucharist. We say a similar word. Why is that? Because as we're receiving Jesus in the Eucharist, we are participating in what we will share for all of eternity. And so he said to me, these words are true. They, they come from God. All, I, I fell at his feet to worship him. And he said to me, don't. I am a fellow servant of yours and of your brothers who bear witness to Jesus. Worship God. Witness, witness to Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Then I saw the heavens open and there was a white horse and its rider was called what? What was the name of its rider? Faithful and true. He judges and wages war in righteousness. His eyes were like a fire, fiery flame and his, on his head were many what? Diadems. He had a name inscribed that no one knows except himself. He wore a cloak that had been dipped in blood and his name was called what? What was his name called? 
the word of God. Now, this is really amazing because if you know the gospel of John, you guys know the gospel of John. In the beginning was the word, the word was with God, and the word was God. So if you know the gospel of John, you also would understand the name of the writer is the word of God, and he must be God if you know John chapter 1, verse 1, right? And this is really uh, one of the indications that we're speaking of the exact same John who wrote the Gospel of John and who wrote the Apocalypse, the book of Revelation. Uh, although some would try to argue that it's John the Elder, the early church, um, the strongest consent was that it was actually John the Apostle. The armies of heaven followed him, mounted on white horses wearing what? What were they wearing? Queen, uh, clean white linen. And you remember that the linen, what does it represent? The works of the saints, okay? Out of his mouth came a sharp sword to strike the nations. What was, what's the sword represent? What do you think that that sword represents? The word of God, exactly. The, uh, he will rule them with an iron rod, and he himself will tread he will rule them with an iron rod, and he himself will tread out in the winepress the fury and wrath of God the Almighty. In other words, all judgment has been given to him. This is an image from Isaiah chapter 63. Um, if, you, if you go to Isaiah chapter 63, you, you, you see an, an image of one who had to endure the wine, the winepress of God's fury. Um, and it's, it symbolically points to the Christ. Verse 16, he has a name written on his cloak and on his thigh. What is the name that's written? King of what? King of kings and Lord of lords. And then I saw an angel standing on the sun, and he cried out in a loud voice to all the birds flying overhead. Come, here, gather for God's great feast to eat the flesh of kings, the flesh of military officers, and the flesh of warriors, the flesh of horses and their riders, and the flesh of all free. free. Slave, small and great. And then I saw the beast. Then I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered to fight against the one riding the horse and against his army. The beast was caught, and with it the false prophet who had performed in its sight the signs by which he led astray those who had accepted the mark of the beast and those who had worshipped its image. The two were thrown alive into the fiery pool burning with sulfur. The rest were killed by the sword that came out of the mouth of the one riding the horse. And all the birds gorged themselves on their flesh. It's a very um, provocative image, to say the least. Uh, but here's what I want to say about 19. Are you guys ready? Okay. So the great multitude, notice that they cry out, Alleluia. Guess how many times Alleluia is going to be said in Revelation 19? Four times, four times. Now, this is really interesting. I wonder if it, if it corresponds with the four cups that were at the Passover celebration. Do you remember how the Passover celebration had four cups? Isn't that interesting? Uh, and there's also four Gospels as well. So four times they're going to cry out and say, Alleluia. Okay. Uh, what does Alleluia mean? What does it mean? Do you guys know what it means? Praise God. Yeah, Alleluia is the shortened version of Hallelujah. Question back here. No? So there, yeah, there, you're, so there's there's four cups traditionally at the Passover. We well we we only hear about we, we only hear Paul, you're talking about the third cup. We only hear about the third cup in First Corinthians chapter sixteen, chapter ten, verse sixteen. Yeah, where Paul says, The cup of blessing which we bless, is it not? a participation in the blood of Christ, a koinonia in the blood of Christ. That's 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 16. So we only hear about that in 1 Corinthians. Yeah. Yeah, but the, 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 point, the, the point is, is that, and it's only a, a, a hypothesis, that as you had four cups at the Passover here, there's four hallelujahs, and four gospels, and here there's four hallelujahs. Uh, so it's only a hypothesis, you know, why four, okay? But it, 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 uh, it also is a contrast to the four beasts in Daniel chapter 7, okay? And so there's, you know, there might be a number of reasons. But I'll, I'll look into the four I'll, hallelujahs and see if there's something more there, okay? So we'll, we'll look at that. Um, 
so you, you have these four hallelujahs, right? And then on the fourth hallelujah, what is proclaimed? Look at what's proclaimed. The Lord reigns. Now, this is really interesting because if you remember what I was telling you before when we started to study Revelation, that, that at one sense, it underlines the eternal reign of our Lord Jesus Christ, his eternal kingship over all things. And so after this, this act of judgment has been completed and poured out, you see God's kingship is established in the fullest way. There is no more opposition to him. We live in a world where we see constant opposition to Christ. We're, we're used to it. We're used to it. We're swayed by it a little bit. But here you see all that opposition falling under God's judgment and being taken away. The Lord reigns. Um, and so, the, so the, the hallelujahs or the alleluias, they can, they can proclaim his reign in the fullest way, his eternal kingship. Let us be glad and rejoice. And so right after that moment when God's eternal kingship is proclaimed, then we are told that the bride is ready. Now we can celebrate the marriage supper of the Lamb. Do you see what it's getting at? Now we can celebrate the marriage supper of the Lamb. This is what we should be longing for every time when we come to Mass and every time we celebrate Mass. Why is there a procession into the church with the cross? Don't you see what we're doing? We are proclaiming Jesus' eternal kingship over all things. And every time we come to receive communion, we receive a participation in the eternal, in the eternal gift that we will celebrate for all of eternity. And so the bride has prepared herself. Okay, uh, what's so interesting, it says, then it says the marriage supper, the lamb has come. And it literally says, it literally says the gune has pre prepared himself or herself. It literally says the wife, the wife, the woman, the church is now prepared. Okay, by repenting, believing in the gospel through her, her works of faith. There's emphasis on works of faith in the book of Revelation. You know, it's, it's more than just a theoretical faith, but it's a lived faith that the book underlines. It underlines the importance of works of faith. And, it, and it's very important to say, it's not underlining that we're saved by our works. It's underlining the need, the need to have a living faith, not a theoretical faith. And that's very important because I think in our modern world, we have this very theoretical concept of faith and we kind of like separate the two. Uh, and here is, here is a more holistic sense of you, you believe the faith and you're living the faith. It's a living faith. And so it can talk about works in a beautiful way because it's a living faith in Christ. Lived out, a cooperation with the Lord and his grace. And so this uh, elusive marriage feast can finally be celebrated. Um, and so... There's much that could be said here. If you look at Revelation chapter 17, the eschatological, Revelation chapter 9, verse 7, the eschatological marriage supper of the Lamb has arrived. The bride has prepared herself. The bride is adorned in a garment. There is a wedding feast. And those invited guests are called what? What are the invited guests called? What are the guests called? The answer is right here. They're called blessed. The guests are called blessed. The sacred marriage feast between the Lord and his people finally can occur. The scriptures over and over again talk about this marriage feast. They long for the day when this feast will take place. The same word for blessed, markarioi, is used in the Beatitudes, by the way. When you read the Beatitudes, the same Greek word is used. Okay. And so... so now, at the very end of the chapter, John, he has this vision. So we have, we're, we have a series of visions that occur. He saw heaven open, and there was, a, there was a, a rider on what type of horse was the rider on? A white horse. And what's the name of the rider? Faithful and true. And he, he rides in righteousness, and he judges in righteousness, and makes war in righteousness. He has many diadems. Notice he has many diadems on his head, okay? Some connect this with the writer in, in Revelation chapter 5, and others will say that, no, this, it's a different writer because those are the four, four horsemen and the four plagues. Um, he has a name. Notice the name that's been given to him. What's, it, what's the name that's been given to him? The first name that you hear, what's the name? 
It's highlighted right up here. The Word of God. Isn't that incredible? The Word of God. He leads the armies of heaven. A sharp sword comes forth from his mouth. And then he's also called, what's the, name, what's the title that he's given? King of kings and Lord of lords. So it's underlining his eternal kingship. So he has another vision. He sees an angel standing on the sun, and, and the angel proclaims God's judgment. Then he has a third vision. He, see, he sees the beasts and the kings of the earth and how they're going to be thrown into the lake of fire. The lake of fire is an image of Gehenna or hell. And so then he has a fourth vision in chapter, uh, chapter 20. Uh, and he sees that Satan is going to be bound for 1,000 years. And after 1,000 years, he will be released. A lot of scholars will say that the number 1,000 is symbolic. Uh, in the early church, there was this, uh, in the early church, they, they kind of argued over this point. Would there be like a literal millennium where Jesus would reign for 1,000 years and then he would, there would be this big battle? Or is it, is it pointing to uh, symbolically to the eternal reign of Christ? And so in the early church, they said, they said no to the literal interpretation of the millennium. You can read about this in the, in the catechism. You can read about this in the early church fathers who beat out this issue of the millennium. But you'll find that uh, some uh, Protestant groups take it literally. Others will take it symbolically. Uh, in the church, we've always seen it. We've always taken it symbolically. Um, and so in vision number five, he saw thrones of judgment that were given to the, given to those who did not worship the beast, those who were martyred in Christ. Uh, thus Paul told the Ephesians that we reign with Christ. And Peter explains that we are members of his royal priesthood. Hence the church traditionally understood that Christ would reign through his church and then definitively conquer Satan and all the forces of evil in his second coming when he comes again. In light of this, Paul does not speak of a literal 1,000 year reign. Hence, when Paul speaks of the resurrection in his letters, he does not mention the 1,000 year reign of Christ. But he, he highlights the importance of preparing ourselves for Jesus's return. So church some church fathers in the second and third century believed in the literal thousand-year reign. However, by the fourth century, the, uh, the thousand-year reign was understood symbolically in light of Jesus' eternal kingship, which is already mentioned in Revelation eleven fifteen. 15. Uh, it says they will be priests of God. These will fulfill the great expectation. When Israel was at Sinai, they were called a royal priesthood. Um, and then it talks about this great victory over Gog and Magog. Uh, these are names that are found in, in Ezekiel chapter 38 and 39. Uh, and so Gog and Magog, many scholars say that they represent, once again, similar to Babylon, the great. They represent all those forces that are opposed to the Lord and his people. Um, and so you'll find a lot of... Um, YouTube videos or sensationalistic literature on Gog and Magog uh, in, uh, you know, kind of especially when you see wars raging in the Middle East. Um, these images come from Ezekiel 38 and 39. Christ spoke of the day when the Gentiles would surround Jerusalem and his prophecy was fulfilled when the Romans under Vespasian surrounded the city in 68 to 69. This Vespasian was elected emperor and his son Titus succeeded him and he led the final siege over Jerusalem in 70 AD when the city and the temple were destroyed. In a certain sense, history will repeat itself when Christ returns. Zechariah spoke of the day when the nations would surround Jerusalem and the Lord would intervene and save his people. You can find that in Zechariah 12 through 14, especially Zechariah 12, 3 and 14, 14. The overwhelming number of nations outnumbering the people of God recalls the great victories of the past. When Abraham rescued Lot in Genesis 14, when the Lord defeated the Pharaoh in Exodus 14, when Israel triumphed over the Midianites in Judges chapter 6 through 8, and when David defeated Goliath in 1 Samuel 17, and there are many other examples. The fire from heaven was often uh, understood as an act of divine judgment, just like fire came upon Sodom and Gomorrah. And in a similar way, we hear of fire coming, coming upon Gog and Magog, fire and brimstone. And so finally, in the sixth vision, he sees a great white throne. 
And the great white throne, it reminds us of Solomon. Solomon built a great white throne for himself, and he overlaid it with gold. It was an earthly, earthly representation of the Lord's kingship. But here we have a great white throne in heaven. So let's take a look at this great white throne here. Are you guys ready? Okay. Okay. So he says, oh, wrong chapter. He says in Revelation chapter 20, Verse 11, next I saw a large white throne and the one who was sitting on it. The earth and the sky fled from his presence. And there was no place for them. I saw the dead, the great and the lowly standing before the throne. The scrolls were opened. Then another scroll was opened. The book of life, the dead were judged according to what? Their deeds. By what was written in the scrolls, the sea gave up its dead. Then death and Hades gave up their dead. All the dead were judged according to their deeds. Then death and Hades were thrown into the pool of fire. This pool of fire is the second death. Why is it called the second death? What do you think the reason, reason it's called the second death for? It's eternal. It's permanent. So it's kind of like John is saying, you know, the first death, you know, that's temporary. The second death is permanent. Anyone whose name was not found written in the book of life was thrown into the pool of fire. Now, this reminds you of in Matthew chapter 25. Do you remember when Jesus talked about the judgment of the sheep and the goats? Do you remember that scene in Matthew 25, verses 31 to 46? Matthew 25, 31 to 46, he talks about the judgment of the sheep and the goats and how just as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats, so the Lord will separate the, the good from those who have done evil. Okay, and then John talks about a new creation. Uh, but let's let's uh, finish on let's uh, let's stop right here, and then we'll start again in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit.